Hi, and welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to Interview, where I'm really excited to have Whitney Scherer here with me today. I had the pleasure of interviewing her both at the Tucson Festival of Books and the Morristown Festival of Books. And after Morristown, I said to her, could you come down to New York so I could shoot an interview with you so that we would be able to get you, I don't know, known to more of our readers and to be able to share the conversation because I had so much fun. So welcome, me Whitney. Too. Thank yeah. you. It's so fun to be here. <laughs> it is like, yeah. So um, her book is The Age of Light. Here it was in hardcover, just out in paperback. Um, I picked this as a book reporter bets on and loved it. I loved it for the period. I, we're going to go into so many reasons why I love this book. <laughs> Excellent. But how about if you tell the readers a little bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, The Age of Light is based on the life of a woman named Lee Miller, who uh, was a model who hated being a model and uh, wanted to pursue her dream of being a photographer. And so in 1929, she moved to Paris and uh, moved to the Montparnasse neighborhood where all the artists and writers lived and became involved with Man Ray, the surrealist artist. Mm -hmm. So the novel uh, is the bulk of the novel is about their love affair and kind of the beginning of her artistic journey but her life is incredible and she after she became a photographer she went on to be one of the first female war correspondents during World War II so the novel also touches on that time that she spent mm -hmm. in World War II and as well as the end of her life so it's kind of a it's a love story and a, and a book about um, p power and ambition and art and sex and food and all and sorts Paris. of things like that and, and, and Paris. Paris and one of and the Paris most amazing times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you began researching this novel after you saw an exhibit of Man Ray and Lee's work yeah. at the Peabody Museum in 2011. So what struck you when you were at that exhibit? Uh, it was such a great exhibit. It was, uh, yeah, my, I, I went there just because my daughter was two and I needed something to do <laughs> and, and because I knew who Man Ray was from some of the art history classes I had taken, but I'd never heard of Lee Miller before. And I walked in like pushing my daughter's stroller and I was just really just truly blown away by Lee Miller's talent, like the minute that I walked in. And I just felt like her life would make such an amazing novel because she she reinvented herself again and mm -hmm. again, like mm -hmm. muse, surrealist artist, fashion photographer, war reporter, you know, it was incredible and rich. Um, so that piece of it captivated me. But then also um, the crazy love affair that she had with Man Ray. Mm -hmm. And they this exhibit did such a good job of, of capturing the, the crazy <laughs> basically like there was this one thing the th one of the things that really captured my attention was they had a piece of paper that they had ripped out of Man Ray's journal on which he had written Elizabeth 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 Lee 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 like over and over and over like a hundred times and I thought like that is so crazy like how how would it feel to be a woman who has that much power over a man as successful and powerful as him wow yeah. so it was all in this one exhibit yeah. so you're just moving your daughter around hoping she stays yes. asleep or whatever <laughs> yes, exactly so, you, know, I'm, you know this is and and immediately then you knew because you hadn't written a novel at that point no i had tried i tr started one other novel before but i primarily was a short story writer up right. until then but i knew i just i knew that this story had to be a novel i just felt like a big story it's a big yeah. big sweeping yeah yeah. So the opening takes place in the 1960s, yeah. and so we've got we've got this prologue and epilogue that you know mm -hmm. sort of you know bank the, the entire book, and you start giving the readers a glimpse into Lee's world as her past days of Man Ray, and I just love it because she still is. Um, I'm going to do it my way, yeah. and she still is even there. What made you decide to open with a prologue like that? So I I wanted to start with the with the prologue which takes place kind of at the end of her artistic life um, because the her story is a story that's that's um, it's empowering and it's inspiring but it's also a tragic story mm -hmm. and she after this amazing career um, post World War II she ended up being very traumatized by the war and she stopped making art so. Um, and I mean like literally, like put all of her negatives and photos into cardboard boxes, taped them closed, hauled them to the attic and never talked about making art again. And I found that so fascinating and sad. Um, and I just that question of like how somebody like her could could stop making art and why. So I wanted to put that question in the reader's mind right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to start at the end and have people wonder about that as they were reading the, the rest of the story. And I liked it because it was the Vogue days. Like she was yeah. writing for Vogue. And so she still had this other career as a writer. She yeah. was doing, you know, besides her life as a model, the photographer, and then this as well. And 
she's sitting there, but you just know it's not going to be the story they want. Yeah. Like they want this like, <laughs> puff piece about Man Ray, and that's not. And she's like, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to tell. That is it. not the story I'm going to tell you. Exactly yeah. <laughs> like it was. You know, she had so many um, different parts of her life. Was one period easier to write about than any of the others, or were they all super complicated? Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, I guess it was probably more sort of more fun to write about Paris, you of know, course. just because yeah. it's Paris and, you know, um, everything. But I mean, it's all complicated in its own way, because mm -hmm. I think in every case, you know, you're, you're just you're getting into the mind of a character and kind of getting to know them. And she's such a complicated woman. I mean, everybody's complicated, but I think she was, she was really complicated. particularly complicated, yeah, you know, and, and so um, I mean, they were it was challenging for that reason. But I, I think the Paris part was the most Fun. Yeah, fun, <laughs> yeah. fun to be writing about, yeah. you know, nights out drinking and partying. And, right, exactly. And what the scene was like at that point, Absolutely. which was, you know, we don't really have anything like that at I this know. this time. Everything is, well, especially now, everything is much more woke. Everything's got to be exactly correct and politically correct. There, there was no political correctness to what no. was going on at all. No, and it was very sexually free and mm -hmm. very artistically free. And I mean, I think that's why people are so obsessed with that time period still, is because we all just yearn to be a part of something like that where so much art was being created and people could just be kind of wild and crazy. And it was so much talent. There yeah. was so much talent. And Craziness. how the talent was intersecting with each other, the writers were intersecting with the artists, you don't see that quite the same way. I know. Writers are together, photographers, film people are together. It's not quite that like now. Yeah. It's everybody's in their own little worlds. Yeah. It, it, or, or if it's happening, it's happening in these teeny little pockets. It's not happening sort of citywide somewhere or something. Something that, you know, that's yeah. so brilliant. So you have all these different timelines in the book. Mm -hmm. And was it hard to weave them together to know, okay, we've got the prologue and then we've got an epilogue where she sees Man Ray again mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving any spoilers away. But um, she sees him again at the end. But in between, was it to write each of those segments and have it all flow, was that a challenge? Yeah, that was one of the, probably one of the biggest challenges of drafting the book was I didn't know how, you know, I didn't initially know how I was going to structure the, the bulk of the book. And I thought that maybe I would have the, I, I, I always knew the prologue would be the prologue and that mm -hmm. it would be in the 60s. But then I thought maybe part one will be Paris and then part two will, will be World War II. That felt like it made sense. <laughs> um, but as I was drafting it um, and I was writing these World War II pieces, they kept coming out as these little like vignettes. one or two page vignettes. Yeah. And they're like these little sort of pieces of flash fiction in a way. And it did, it wasn't until, I mean, I did so many drafts, I don't know, but you know, draft whatever. <laughs> draft 344. <laughs> 3.95 or whatever it was, mm. where I started to think about those those chapters from World War II functioning almost like little traumatic memories mm -hmm. that were kind of cutting up through the surface of this larger story about Paris that Lee Miller is you know, sort of trying to tell in the book. And so once I thought about that, that was when the structure came together because I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. It's like the, the Paris piece is, is this main story and then it's punctuated by these these strange, almost jarring memories. Yeah, because that, you're sitting there like, wait, what is going on yeah. with her? Where is she it, now? Yeah. But you're realizing how much the future is influenced by the past. Yeah. Everything is, and that's what I saw when I was reading yeah, it. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. And there's like these little, you know, like each one that feels jarring and it feels very different. And I, and I meant it to feel that way, but there are like little things like the, you know, the smell of metal will be in the previous chapter and then it'll sort of appear in the Segway World War II. So I kind of tried to do that throughout, but. Yeah, it was, um, I don't know, when I was just sitting there, was, I, I was looking at these pieces, I'm like, well, why is this coming up now? Yeah. And then as you got smarter about reading the book, it was yeah. like, oh, this was going on. Was the title always The Age of Light? It was always The Age of Light. You always yeah. did. And what's the significance of the title? Is it the light of photography, the light so, of... So, I mean, it's a few things. I mean, first off, it's uh, the title of a Man Ray essay. So mm -hmm. I stole it from Man Ray. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 um, Wait, one for us. <laughs> 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 uh, and then to me, it's like the Age of Light in the sense of this this beautiful time at the beginning of her artistic career in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the idea of light and how that what that means in the photographic world so it kind of has a few meanings for it, me. a dual meanings yeah, and yeah. each cover it's expressed someplace different yeah, it's yeah. like you know the golden here mm -hmm. and the golden over here they're mm -hmm. just very very different yeah but it's um uh, yeah it, it, it almost when you think back you couldn't think of a different title like when i finished oh, it, it was like it was just like it was exactly what it was because of it was the lighting the room the lighting of her face oh good and then i also felt like it was the lighting of gunfire mm. of when you got over yeah. into the war of what yeah. was going on yeah, absolutely. So, and it was, and also, she was so dark, and we're going to get into mm -hmm. that a little bit later, mm -hmm. that 
the age of light is the brighter times in her life and the yeah. others were so dark. Yeah. And that's what I definitely saw as I was reading as well. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted I wanted that to sort of be the takeaway too. Like even though the story is sad, you know, there is this this feeling of lightness to her and to her legacy and that sort of thing. And she came on the scene at such a really interesting time because mm -hmm. I think few people know that magazines were illustrated yeah. before that. There was yeah. no photography. There was nothing. So when she became the face, it was the kind of thing where we hadn't done that before. It wasn't photography. Yeah. And then when she wanted to do photography, it's so different than the way it is now. Like yeah. now where everything's airbrushed. Yeah. Everything is Instagrammable moments. Everything is like, whereas what turned you on about the fact of photography, where you shoot a picture, but it's really not made till in the dark room? Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, that is what I love about photography. And I've, I've studied photography in my own life, and I did it in high school and college. But what I loved about it was the dark room work. Like to me, I mean, I still take pictures and, um, you know, and I still love it. But it was the act of actually the hands-on sort of creation mm -hmm. and, and, and watching art like come to life in front of you in the dark room that I just loved. And so it was really fun. You know, when I when I started writing this book, I was like, oh, this is amazing. I get to spend time in the dark room right. again while writing this book. And the solutions and fixing yeah, it. And, and also how you could change the look of a picture. Oh yeah. So yeah, it's much such more quickly. Form. Which now you manipulate it with yeah. computer. But it's not the same thing as the raw edge yeah. made smooth. It's or, not the same level of craft, I think. That's exactly. Yeah. And people who have done that I remember when I was at the magazine, we started shooting digital. Mm -hmm. It became a thing. But before that, you were waiting for the slides to come in yeah. that had come oh, through, yeah. and then you know what you were going to do. And I always used to kill me because the pictures on the front of the magazine, everybody wants to look like the models. Yeah, they should see. They no one look like that. <laughs> it's going to the office. Nobody look like that. It was yeah. like after lots of retouching. Yep. And if you really looked at some pictures, you could see like where the retouching had been. Yeah, I know. It was. You mentioned before about how it was this strange period where it was like illustration to photography, which which is so fascinating. Fascinating, I think. And mm -hmm. actually, when Lee Miller began her career at Vogue in 1927, her first job was as the cover of Vogue magazine. But it was an illustration of her, right. actually. So she was, she really was there, right on that tipping point. And then there was this uh, uh, photo taken of her by Edward Steichen, um, who, of course, is so famous. And he took this beautiful photo, and it was right as the magazines were starting to have photographs instead of illustrations inside. And the photograph got sold to Kotex. And they did one of the first like sanitary napkin ads that's ever appeared in a women's fashion with magazine. Lee with Lee Miller. Without her knowledge. So there was this huge scandal about that. And that was actually a piece of what made her want to quit modeling. And, or and she, she kind of used it as an excuse. As to an excuse. Modeling. To sit yeah. down and say, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. And I think it was Fiona Davis's book had somebody who had been an illustrator. Oh. And they Oh, all yeah. lost their jobs yeah, right. because illustration just went out the window. All ads used to be illustrated. Yep. Um, it was just a very, very different time. I know. Linwood Bummer. Barclay's dad was one of the people who drew, who oh. did all the drawings for the car ads and That's things so like cool. that. Oh. But it was such a different age. But now we've got everything. Now everything is completely instant. Yeah. Oh, everything I know. Is well, think about being a war photographer where you had to send back, you know, these little rolls of film in, in, the, in the mail <laughs> and like how long that took. And now it's just, just it's, email It's it on from, the fly. But you yeah. can also now interpret a story completely differently. Mm -hmm. You can manipulate. And yeah. I think that that's one of the really interesting things that's going on too. That you couldn't manipulate back then. There was the shot that you yeah. took. You could manipulate the color or the tone, but you couldn't manipulate the subject quite yeah. the same way not that you in, can do not now. Not in the same way. No. no. No, the manipulation all came in from just how you framed it or what mm -hmm. you cropped out and sort of your artistic vision rather than literal manipulation of the actual subject yeah, matter. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. wait, wait, is that really who did what? You yeah. know, it's it, we're just in a, such a very, very different time. But I found it was interesting, too, though, because she was became this face mm -hmm. at a time where that was um, that was something that was highly regarded. Mm. And it, was, it wasn't just you were illustrated, it's your photo was yeah. out there. It was, you know, and you became this um, hanger mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of models felt that they were that way. The clothes were put on them. And they were really treated like you know hangers at that point. Yeah. Of you make it look good, you smile, you yeah. do this, you do that. Yeah, I mean, I th which I think is sort of still true to, uh, to some degree. I mean, certainly the world of modeling still has its issues, although it's, it's issued now. But really, what's interesting is I worked at Connie Nast during the years mm -hmm. of the supermodel. Like oh, there were yeah. all the supermodels, yeah. and it was you know Chris Turlington, you know blah blah Kim Lexis, all the all these big supermodels. In fact, it's an interesting um, documentary about the supermodels on Netflix a couple mm. of years ago, and. 
that was like that time, but now it's celebrity. Mm -hmm. Celebrity was on the cover. If you yeah. go into a store and you see magazine covers, it's not usually models that it's, are on the cover. It's true. And we were shooting, um, I think it was like the early 80s, there was this way that you could shoot with light that the model's eyes would reflect the mm -hmm. camera. Oh, so that huh. when you were in the store, the eyes would have this appeal. I surely should have brought one in to show you because oh, it's so weird. That like, you would actually be looking, they, they look like they were looking more towards you. Oh, weird. Oh, and it was so this, cool. and huh. everybody started shooting like that yeah. then because that was the thing to do. And it was like this reflection of light because on the newsstand it would pop, but yeah. you know, like, what's a newsstand? You know, <laughs> it's a place where you buy candy in New York, you know. Yeah. Um, her life, her early life was mm -hmm. scarred. Yeah. first by her uncle and then by her father. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what that was about. Yeah, she experienced uh, really deep childhood trauma. Um, she was raped by a man that they called uncle. It was actually just a family friend. Um, she was raped at the age of seven. And then, um, and her parents you know, knew about it and, and took her to a psychologist. And then starting at the age of eight, um, ostensibly to help her heal, her father began taking nude photographs of her. And he continued that practice well into her 20s. And he thought of them as art photos. And, you know, oftentimes he was like, recreating a famous painting or you know something like, like that. Like posing her. And posing certain, her you know yeah. looking like a dryad in the woods or, or whatever but you know I mean <laughs> as a modern you know viewer of this we think what you know child, child pornography. pornography. Yeah absolutely um, and I think the view of it was was slightly different at the time although it certainly was strange even then um, and that experience just absolutely just totally scarred her as it would um, and I think the way that she dealt with that trauma was actually to, um, I, th I think that she began to like not understand her worth as a woman in the world beyond mm -hmm. her body. I mm -hmm. think it was, was one piece of it. And I think it also kind of made her hungry for danger. Like it, she, she put herself sort of more out into the world in every way. Um, you know, I mean, literally in every way. She had many sexual partners. She went to war and, you know, she was constantly sort of looking for these situations the where she would be on the edge. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think that's just how she dealt with that trauma, but that was what led her to do her war work, I mm -hmm. think. So in a sense, the art that she created um, at the end of her career was kind of informed by what happened in her childhood, but I think it's also the thing that made it so, um, made the war itself so traumatizing to her. Yeah, because it was like, wait a second, I'm, I'm dealing with all these dark emotions. Exactly. Dark emotions like, are bubbling right back up. And she right just couldn't, she didn't have sort of that, that um, base to deal with it. She didn't know how to deal with it or separate herself from what she was seeing and feeling. Yeah, because if you're ever in a tough environment, you're thinking of happier times. And right. the times when you had been young and it would have been happy, she didn't have those. She didn't have there those. There was that trauma yeah. back and there. And she had that sort of, rep and it was all about repressing it. You know, the, the psychologist that she went to <laughs> supposedly told her something like, take these memories and put them in a little box and throw away the key and just never think about them again. That was the method of dealing with, with trauma. That was so, the, you know, if you come further, if you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank God, you know, but if you've been told that and then you're put into this new traumatic situation, of course, those memories are going to resurface. And, and in some ways, if you're doing that inside the box, the camera was the box yeah. as well. It's so, so true. it's really like, you know, you're taking everything, everything that you've done is in this other little box right now. So then you want to be able to free yourself by having control over the box. Yes, yeah, And I think absolutely. it was really interesting. You know, oh, when I think about her being objectified over her looks, I think about when she went to war, where yeah. she was wearing, you know, fatigues, yep. or their the version of fatigues, and yep. she was very mannish and androgynous. Her look yep. became very, very androgynous. And it's almost like I felt like she looked comfortable in that kind of look because she could hide. Oh, She could absolutely. hide behind herself. Yeah, you know? no, I think she, um, I mean, I think she said that her army uniform was the most comfortable outfit she ever put, put on. She said that she loved when other soldiers would come up to her and not immediately recognize that she was a woman. You know, I mean, she she just, yeah, she felt she felt hidden, um, hidden and safe in this, in this new way. In this whole different point. Yeah. So there's a very iconic photo that she took. Yeah. So let's talk about that photo because I've seen it um, in a number of different places. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this photo, you're like, wow, that was really making a statement. So it was shot where? So, yeah. So her, her most famous photo, I would say, is a photo um, that she, she staged with her photography partner uh, taking a bath in Hitler's bathtub in Munich. So it was um, right after Hitler fled Munich at the end of the war. And she and Dave Sherman, who was a life photographer, were ahead of their regiment. And they got to Hitler's apartment before anybody else got there. And, you know, the sort of legend goes, they 
they were there for many hours. They like rifled through all his stuff and they took a nap in his bed, supposedly, which oh, sends so chills creepy. down my spine. Yeah, 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 it's just yeah. like, ooh. And then, and then staged this photo of her and it's just, it's an incredible photo because mm -hmm. they have, uh, her army uniform is folded and you know sitting on a chair. Her muddy combat boots are dirtying up the bath mat right in front of where she's bathing. And then they, they I mean, I assume they placed this there. There's a photo of, of Hitler like on the rim of the bathtub and it's just chilling. It's really chilling because you're sitting there going, this beautiful woman, because she is yeah. beautiful. Yeah, she's gorgeous. She's beautiful yeah. because she doesn't have a, all the fatigues on at that yeah. point or whatever. And it's just this like in your face kind yeah. of a shot. And it's cool too, because it shows you exactly her personality, yes. which is yes. just, she's just a total badass. And, right. You know, and that's what you see when you see this photo. It's just bold and, and um, kind of snubbing her nose at Hitler. And it's really, it's an amazing shot. Yeah. Well, you just looked at that and like, like that's a shot of the war. Yeah. Like that's one of those yeah. ones that you're, you're definitely going to want to think about, iconic yeah, thinking definitely. about it. So why do you think she boxed up the photos? Do you think it was just a moment of her life? Like I've got to take it away, put it away. It was too I think hard. She, um, you know, I think she was, she was suffering from PTSD, which, um, which, you know, they didn't have that term then, but that's totally what it was. Right. And, it paralyzed her. And so taking photos and writing just became harder and harder and harder for her. And she was clinically depressed and she was drinking and, and all this stuff in it. And I think she just made the decision that it would be easier to not do it and not think about it than to keep struggling and, and to not have the emotion of creating yeah. art yeah. because I think that's I think a lot of people forget that and I know the writers that I work with is there's a lot of emotion that goes onto the page there's a lot of emotion that goes into making a photograph and to just not have that in you to do it anymore yeah. it's and I think a lot her, of energy you know for her it's like it was everything about her life because she went from she sort of reclaimed photography from this childhood trauma that she'd experienced it became her thing and then it was like the the war sort of took it away from her again mm -hmm. and so you know that to me is is the reason why like the war was this final trauma that made photography impossible for her again yeah because she, what she had done with it was something that was cruel like yeah. it was it was just photographing cruel yeah. instead of beauty yeah. instead of you know objects of whatever mm -hmm. so is there a moment when you're developing a photo, because I know that you've done this, mm -hmm. that you just sit there and say, um, I've got it. I've got this, this very special moment. It, it's, it's crystallized for me of what's going on. Mm. Or are you constantly saying, I can improve upon it? Mm. I mean, probably every artist is different. Or I, I mean, I guess maybe every photo shoot is different, you know? Because mm -hmm. I, I when I uh, used to work in the darkroom, I remember specific moments where, you know, you've got your contact sheet, you've printed out all the negatives and you can, you're looking through the loop mm -hmm. and you can see that one photo and you're like, ah. Oh. That's, that's it. That's it. So I have I have had that experience, um, but you know, then other times I think you, you, I'm sure you know you're just like, oh, I don't know. I looked at and, 25 and they all look exactly the same. Exactly. And nothing special. Yeah, yeah. And maybe I could crop it or darken it or you know whatever. But it's true with writing too. I yeah. mean, I feel like sometimes you know you're just like, yes, I have it. And other times you just have to keep working and you feel like you never get it right. So when you, how many drafts of this book did you do? Many? Um, I mean, it took me five years to write it. Right. So I don't know how many drafts I did. Five, maybe five and or six. Did you have a set time of day that you were writing every day or was it, you know, like an idea I did it. It went through different phases because when I started working on it, I was working full time and mm -hmm. my daughter was still pretty young, still mm -hmm. stroller age. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, over the course of writing the book, I ended up switching to a part-time job and then working from home. So I was, I had more time to write, but I like to write in the morning right. um, if I can, just because I think like the voices are quieter. <laughs> yeah, you know? so. And do you get up early to do that or is Some, it? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I mean, I certainly did when I was up. working full time, I had to get up really early and do it. And um, now I, now I send my daughter to school and then I write from like, you know, 8 a.m. till however long I can do it for. So yeah. And just yeah. be able to do that. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting because, um, as you're sitting and writing, it changes. Like the, the way you're writing changes because at the beginning, it's just getting the ideas down, just yeah. getting that rough yeah. first draft. And then it's from there, like yeah. refining, which actually, what, what do you find easier, writing or editing? I think I find editing easier, actually, mm -hmm. because I, as I'm trying to write my second book, yes. as <laughs> I'm realizing, it's like the writing, the first writing part is very hard. It's very hard. Um, and because the, the editing, it feels more like a manageable task. And I have this whole system where it's like small, medium, and large changes, and I make lists of them. And okay. so then, depending on how much time I have on a given day, I'm like, okay, today I have time to tackle a medium task or, or a big task, big being like, you know, add an entire chapter or 
cut an entire character or whatever. You know, right, yeah, cutting like the character kind of like things. Yeah. Research lamps in 1930s Paris or whatever. Um, I could do that part. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's, the, that's the fun part, right? That's the fun <laughs> that's part, the yeah. Easy. It's like the small tasks are easy. Right. But so that, you know, so that feels more manageable, whereas um, the first draft, it's all about sort of following the excitement and the inspiration mm -hmm. and, and the hunger of why you want to write the book. And I don't, have a good method for that. I just sort of have to just follow it wherever it goes. Right. So it's um. It's, you don't outline in advance. Did you outline it? I I didn't outline for the first draft of this book. I wrote what I did when I first started was I actually went to the photographs and I would write scenes directly from some of the photographs, mm. and that helped me kind of get into the characters' heads and figure it out. But. It, I didn't have the whole structure in my mind. I just had these weird little islands <laughs> of scenes. And then for the second draft, I outlined I outlined the crap out of it. I mean, I have this huge outline in Excel that's like many, many columns. And it, it's like the, near, the plot arc, the emotional arc, wow. the sensory details, like all these. I mean, it's, it's really, it's pretty intense. But I couldn't do that for the first draft. I had to take what I had and then transplanted into that. And then did you have photos of them around so that you were surrounded by like yeah. what they looked like yeah. so that you could have the setting and what's happening? Yeah, I had photos. I have a big bulletin board and I had photos printed out and, and snippets of, you know, different things from her essays and things like that. And I also made a Pinterest page. I was just going to say, I was out of your Pinterest yeah. page this morning looking around. It was so interesting because you've got so many great photos of the two of them. Yeah. But it's definitely, I highly recommend people go look at it. Your handle out on Pinterest. It's Interest is, um, I think it's W. Sharer. Yeah, it's I just, think so yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, and you just go out there and look at what your inspiration was along the way. Yeah. Because it looks like an inspiration board. Yeah, no, it totally is. And I, I mean, some of the photos are like they're not Man Ray and Lee Miller. They're like you know Biarritz in 1930. And, mm -hmm. You know, I have like all really every photo I used pretty much is on that page. So yeah. It's, so, so I would like call that up and look at it all the time. But I think that that becomes really important because for readers, if you're in a book group go out and take a look at that page because you're going to be able to see yeah. this was the inspiration. And I loved looking through it this morning because yeah. I was like, wait, I have these people drawn in my head. Oh, yeah, And now course. all of a sudden, this is what they actually look like. This yep. is what the scenarios actually look like. And I, I think it's... I think that Pinterest can be a nice tool for an author to use yeah, yeah. to get the readers drop more into what's going yeah. on. Yeah, oh, I think it's great for that sort of thing. And it's funny, I've been asked a bunch of times, like, did you consider including photographs in the novel? And I never did, actually, right. because to me, then it's a biography. You know, mm -hmm. like, I just don't, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But I did have them, you know, what I what I hope is that people will read the book and then they'll go look at the photos. It's, you know, I absolutely feel like they're very connected. Yes. But they didn't belong in the novel. They didn't have to be in the own. novel. No, yeah. there's not like a photo gallery yeah. in the middle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You've talked about being a very visual writer. And yeah. what do you mean by that? Because <sighs> yeah, I yeah. definitely felt your writing was visual. I felt like I could see her and I had never looked at a picture of her. Oh, so, that's, oh good. Okay, well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it, um, task done. I mean, I think... It's so, I find it very hard to describe the process of writing. I, I, I wish I were better at it, but I, but I think what I do is I, I really do just picture the scene and I picture the character walking around and then I feel like objects and the room and the setting are very meaningful for me. And so I have to kind of know the whole setting of where they are. And, and, um, and I mean, to me, it feels like, doesn't everybody write that way? Yeah, yeah. But but I don't think that they do. You know, I mean, it's it's clear that of course not everybody writes that way. So I think I think that's what I'm doing is I'm I am like a little camera, kind of walking around and picturing the scene before I write it down. And I think that may have something to do with your talent as a photographer, because Maybe. of wanting to yeah. be a photographer. It's like I see the scene, yeah. and then I can write, you know, through it from there. Yeah. Did you always have knowledge of um, art and Paris and the other aspects of your story? Was that a lot of research that you had to do? That was a lot of research. I mean, I you know I. I've always been interested in that time period and everything like like everybody is basically so I've read tons of books but I did I did a lot of research on mm -hmm. the era and um, surrealism which I didn't know that much about before mm -hmm. I began um, the politics of the time that sort of thing so I did I read kind of very widely um, around the era just so that I could understand it with the circle fiction though there's license for you know taking the story in a different direction did you find you tried to rein yourself in on that just so that you were trying to be as authentic at every moment? Or was it some things had to be sacrificed for the sake of the story? I mean, I made changes uh, for the sake of the story and I fictionalized, you know, a, a large portion of the book, uh, but always with the with the 
feeling of trying to trying to keep things authentic and mm -hmm. keep it true to the spirit of who the people were. Yeah. So the whole time I was writing, I, I was very conscious of like, okay, if I have them doing something that didn't actually happen, can I point to something they really did that in my mind is sort of equal? And they can interplay back and forth. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I think when you write historical fiction, you have to be, you just have to be that really, really conscious of that sort of thing. And, 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 um, really define like your relationship to authenticity mm -hmm. um, because you're writing about real people and you kind of, you owe it to them. You owe it to them to get it yeah. right. So what's the most exciting thing about researching historical women? Like what did you love about oh, the, this deep dive oh, that you I did? Oh, I mean, I loved all of it. You know, I mean, it's, I love, I mean, first off, I love writing about real people because mm -hmm. I love this idea that you have a life that you're um, pushing against the boundaries of. And that's, your plot is kind of, um, the puzzle pieces within that life. I think that's great. But just, I mean, but the research, like I did so much research that, <laughs> you know, did I need to be doing it? Probably not, but you know, like fashion, Vogue in those years, like all right. these, you know, other women photographers of the era, um, so many things like that, that are just fascinating. And there was a whole social scene that was oh, all surrounding yeah. that. So you had to understand that yeah. to understand who they were at Absolutely. that particular time and place as yeah. well. It was, it was a real hardship. <laughs> it's also interesting. So. so you created this Pinterest page with pack background on the book. Did you do that as you were going along and keep it hidden? I don't know if you can keep hide Pinterest. And then later on when the book came out, like show these things, yeah, is that basically exactly what you did? did? Yeah. You can make like a private page and, private then, page I, and, and then I made it that. public when I was done. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Anybody <laughs> who's um, reading it with your book club or whatever, you know, definitely go out and take yeah. a look because there are so many different, like they're little vignettes back yeah. there. Yeah. So you've done a lot of uh, traveling about yeah. this, a lot of touring about I this have, book. I think yeah. you're just back from Germany. I, yes, I just got back right before Thanksgiving. I, Thanksgiving. Yeah. So what's it like, how has the book been received differently in the States? And I believe you were in Paris to, and yeah. London yeah. as well as being in Germany. I was. Um, so there's so many differences actually. It's so, it's so interesting. I mean, um, the book is being received well in, in all the play, in, in everywhere that it's been published so far, I think. <laughs> um, but what's been really interesting is going and doing interviews in different countries and just seeing the difference in what type of questions mm -hmm. you get asked. Mm -hmm. So I, um, when I went to Paris, uh, the Spanish publishing company actually came to Paris and brought some journalists and they were very, their questions were like very philosophical and very like connecting, they wanted to connect Lee Miller to all these other artists and just like these very big sort of sweeping intellectual questions. So cool. I was like, wow, you want my opinion on all these intellectual matters. And then, and then similarly in Italy, they wanted to know, um, it was also very intellectual, but it was all questions about like the modern political climate. So it was wow. less questions about the book and more questions about modern politics. And I thought, well, I'm a novelist, but they're, you know, but they're like, we, we want our novelists to tell us what they think about the modern era. It's like, wow. It's really interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. And then the big difference in Germany was the type of events that they do there because mm -hmm. their, their, um, the readings are 90 minutes to two hours. Really? Yes. So Everyone are they gets. interviews or? So <laughs> it Whoa. was crazy. It was, I it was cool, but it was crazy. It is a combination of reading and interview. And in, in every city that I visited, they had a German actress who traveled with us who would read the book in German. So I would read like a few pages from the beginning and then she would take over and she first she read for like 25 minutes. And then they did a Q&A with me that went on for 20 minutes. And then she read two more times, like a chunk that was 10 minutes and another chunk that was another 10 minutes. Wow. And then questions in between all of that. So it was really, it was like 90 minutes no Q and A from the audience. Just the entire event lasted that long, and the German audience is excited and happy to sit there that long. <laughs> oh my gosh! That's I know. So different. It's, it's so, so different. different. Here. here, if it's like if you talk for twenty minutes or oh. a half hour, it's a big deal. If you read for more than five minutes, people right. are like snapping. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. 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 It's it's like, was, oh, I think I have to go now. And you know? it was so funny because the first night. I thought it, I mean, honestly, I thought it went on forever. Right. And, I, and I was like, especially the first 25 minute reading, I was like so stressed. I was sitting there and I was like, they're so bored. This is terrible. And then when it was over, I was asking my publicist, I was like, you know, how, did, did you think that was a little long? She's like, oh no. Oh, it was perfect. It was great. <laughs> And we're like, okay, I guess that's what you want. It's a totally bookish audience. I know. In the United States, yeah. would never get away with that. Never. never. No, never. No, people would be, they would be like on their phones or like leaving, you know. 
But I have to say that when we did the interviews both in Tucson and when we were in Morristown, the people were riveted. Yeah. I mean, we will confess that when we were in Morristown, the room was packed. I mean, they packed. were packed up to the gills. And we were sitting there like, oh my gosh, what firewalls? I know. Fly? It's like, like is that balcony like, yeah. going to survive all this? It was, all was crazy. All those people. It was yeah. really crazy. It was cool, and it though. was just, there were so many people in all the aisles and yeah. stuff like that. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved I it. I think people will sit there for a, for a conversation. Like, mm -hmm. in the, you know, in the U.S., like you can have a conversation that lasts an hour, but I don't think you could read for 25 minutes. No. I don't think an audience would no. I don't think would sit there that. No. Yeah. You recently taught at the Kauai Writers Workshop. Yeah. And how did that come about and what did you actually do while you were there? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was great. Uh, it came, I think that it came about um, primarily through my agent who mm -hmm. had been there one time a couple years ago. And so I think she recommended me to go. Uh, and I co-taught a class with uh, Priya Parmar mm -hmm. who wrote Vanessa and Her Sister. Oh, which wow. have, It's such a good yeah, book. Such oh, such a good book. God, so yeah. good. And so we taught a master class, which lasted for, it was like three hours a day for four days. Wow. On historical that's a fiction. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah. It was, um, you know, it was, it was a pretty intense yeah. class. It was great. And then after that, there was a, a more traditional conference section with big panels and stuff like that. But I mean, it was in Kauai at this beautiful hotel right on the beach. It was really, it's a it rough was trip. Lovely. It was, it was, rough. it was hard. You know, when they, <laughs> when they invited me, I'm like, oh. How could I? Yes, I can come. <laughs> yes, I can come. Let me just hold one moment. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah. This will be perfect. <laughs> I can absolutely do this. Yeah. Did you meet any authors for the first time there? I did, yeah. So um, I met Paula McLean. Yeah, who I love Paula. I have wanted to meet forever because I love her writing and she blurbed my book. Like, yeah. and so that was really fun. And I met Meg Wallitzer um, and I saw Amanda Air Ward, who I've. Um, met before but years ago and I'd never met Priya in person so pretty much everybody that I met was um was new it was new like the first and, time and lovely it, it, when we had gone together in Tucson it, there was this big room where everybody has like their break room where the authors are and it's so much fun to just see all the authors yeah. meeting each other yeah. for the first time oh, and it's, it's like so fun. I didn't know so and so I didn't know yeah. so and so and we had such a good time because everybody's just talking plot or what, what their issues were and what yeah. was going on and I find that in, at least when we were in Tucson, everybody was wickedly honest. Oh, totally. And the same thing in Morristown. Everybody was honest about yeah. what was going on. It was no putting on airs. It yep. was nothing like that. And I think it's like refreshing because people don't realize how tough it is to be a writer yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Well, I think that's why when you get together with other writers at, a, at one of these festivals, it's like, it's like food for your soul, you know, because mm -hmm. there aren't that many people who really understand. No. And so then you have these moments where, like meeting Marie Benedict was so much right. fun in Morristown and she's so lovely and we hit it off and it was just great to be able to talk about it. It was so fun when I interviewed the two of you and I saw you having lunch later on yeah. and you're just chatting about was And those camaraderie, that those kind of relationships, yeah. because everybody goes through the same things if you're yeah. honest. Yeah. And I find that like when it happens like that, you can thrive and learn from each other. I and there's totally so many agree. people, everybody goes up against the wall at some point. Everybody yeah. has this happen at that point. And to hear from somebody else how they got through that kind of a situation. Oh, it's it's beyond helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. if not, it's like, oh, I think it's just me. <laughs> I know. You know? <laughs> Why me? <laughs> what do you think was the um, most helpful the thing about getting your MFA? What do you think was the most helpful in, you know, because... I've, I've often heard people go, I went and yeah. got my MFA. Was it intense writing? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think the probably the most helpful piece of it was having the time to write. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, just to have two years to focus on my writing. Um, I taught while I was there, and so I think it, it um, helped me become a better teacher, which was not what, what I went for necessarily, but I think was actually really useful. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, just the connections with the other students who, mm -hmm. you know, last the, those connections last for the rest of your life. Right. Are you in a writer's group now? Yeah, and I am. I am, and I love them. It's the greatest. And you, so you read each other's work yes. and comment. Yeah. And, and is there anybody, or does everybody comment on everybody's, or do you say, you know what, you're going to be the best to be working with me? We do a couple different things. We've been together in this group for eight or nine years now. Oh. Yeah. Wow. And, um, and so over the years, we've morphed it a little bit. But for the most part, we all comment on everybody's pieces. But then when somebody has like a full project done, um, we do we do like a side group. And so you give your entire manuscript to a handful of people. Okay. And at that point, I think we all know like who is the best reader for who everybody else's work. And so, you know, you're going to say, oh, I want to read, I want to read Alex's novel because I, or memoir, because, you know, I love, I love their work. And Right. Um, and has yeah. everyone been published at this point, or there's still some people that? It, um, 
Everybody has think? been published. Um, you know, there's there's a handful of people who still have don't have a book length work out, but right. they're getting you know New York Times op eds published left and right and things like it. that. So yeah, it's been a really successful group. And I think that people don't understand that writing can be a very solitary and lonely kind yeah. of thing as well because it's you and your and there's sometimes that laptop. Is not, you're hitting those keys and the words yeah. are not coming that you want there. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah, it's at least being able to have that to relate to somebody. Yeah. No, and it's, a, it's such a weird uh, life because you go out on tour like I've done for this year and you just feel like you're meeting people all the time and everything's crazy. And now I'm at the end. You know, I'm, right. I'm, I'm pretty much done with travel. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to be back in my room yeah. all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be very the, different. Yeah, staring yeah, at that laptop screen. Like, oh, boy. <laughs> and, and, you know, it used to be, I think it was word, word, worse when it was word perfect, where the thing would just beep at you like yeah, this. And you right. start <laughs> playing the, the cursor, page, like, like the evil the, cursor. The, 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 just something to have going out oh, there. Oh, so true. So is the writer's group you're in the um, Arlington Author Salon? Is that no, what that, that's no, a different thing. That so, um, yeah, so my writing group is called the Chunky Monkeys. <laughs> oh, I um, love that. Yeah. The Chunky Monkeys. The Chunky Monkeys, yeah. Which for various reasons too boring to explain to you but that's what we're called and then the Arlington Author Salon is a reading series that oh, um, okay. I uh, co-founded with a group of writers in in the Boston area I live in Arlington so it takes place at a cafe on a quarterly basis and it's just it's really fun it gets about a hundred people oh, nice. packed into this cafe um, every time we do it and it's just it's a blast so well, that sounds so totally perfect yeah too. oh yeah, it's, it's like right up your alley at the yeah, same time yeah so have you spoken to book groups in between all the travel and everything else that you've done this year? I have. I've just started, you know, I've done not tons of that. It's sort of, that's the piece that I'm going to be doing more of now that yes. the book's out in paperback. Yes. Um, but I have, and I love it. And I love, I've, I've talked to groups that have done outside reading and read like Lee Miller's biography. I have talked to groups that have, you know, brought in the photos, like you're saying, to look them up on Pinterest. And it's just always really fun to see the connections that people make and, well, I also love it that you have a, like for more suggested reading in the back of yeah, the book, yeah. which I think is just great for a group to be able to go out and do that. And sometimes I've heard that groups each take a different book and oh. then go back and report about oh, it. That's a and smart way to do it. So that there is yeah. a way to get more involved with the book, especially those people who are more passionate about the writing or yeah. whatever. So it yeah. was just something to be able to do. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, has there ever been a moment of your meeting with a book group? I mean, sometimes authors go, I did not know that I wrote that in that book until they explained it to me. Has there ever been something that they just brought to light to you that you're like, wow, I didn't quite see that, you know? I that I definitely had that experience. Of course, am I going to be able to tell you an example? Because no, I'm not. But but yeah, there have been moments where I'm like, oh, I didn't see it that way. But now that you say it, I'm like, yes, that is, that is there in the pages. Um, it's, but that's what's cool about being a writer, I think, mm -hmm. is that you know, it's all about this relationship that you have with the reader and the reader is bringing their own life and experiences to the mm -hmm. pages. And so mm -hmm. of course they're going to see things there that you weren't necessarily like totally aware of. Well, for me, having worked at Condé Nast and where it opens, yeah. where she's writing for Vogue and it opens to that, it was very interesting to me because it was like, yeah, this is what you're going through. And mm. I think that people also think that words just come out on the page. And I don't <laughs> think they know that sometimes people are tortured yeah. to get those words onto the page. Yeah. And also when you hit different milestones in your career, like every once in a while you hear a writer and saying, I'm not writing anymore. Yeah. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. And there are people that are coming up in their careers and they're very few authors that you hear, oh, I'm stopping writing, but yeah. it is happening. And yeah. it's happening like, you know, more and more because we have social media now. You mm -hmm. hear some people saying, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. There is no next book or whatever. Right. And what I felt like when I was, was well, you know, reading the book, I was thinking about to those Condé Nast days mm -hmm. where everybody was creating all the time. Mm -hmm. It was this, this this moment where it was this photographers and the models and yeah. fashion and where the whole thing played together, the connection yeah. between it all. Yeah, you know, or among it all. Oh, that's cool. See, because so you probably brought so much more to the. book I had a different through view. That, yeah, yeah. I, I was through that lens. Yeah. my lens was completely different yeah. because I, love I just remembered being in the art department mm -hmm. where Alexander Lieberman was down there with a loop mm -hmm. looking on the pictures and pitching the picture that was going to be on the cover. Yeah, and you're that's picturing okay. like you know what photograph, or you have to reshoot. And those moments where you just don't have it. Yeah. And these boxes of, of you know, um, slides were coming in. At the time it was slides. Ugh. And you would just sit there and go through it and go, do we have this? Can this be color corrected? And I think also people have no idea how much gets corrected. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No, they probably don't. I had right the now. coolest experience in Germany. The last event that I did there was in Munich at um, a museum called uh, Villa Stuck. And they have an exhibit going right now that's 40 years of German Vogue. Mm. And so that was why they had me at the museum. Yeah, because yeah. They, obviously, it's a good pairing. But they, um, the, the guy who curated the exhibit came and gave us a tour of the whole exhibit. And it was so great because they had, you know, 
different photos through the 40 years, different outfits that people had worn. And then they had, he said that they had just done it for fun, but it was so cool. They'd made a curtain with every cover that they'd ever had in their 40 years of German Vogue and, and hung the curtain so it was sort of like wavy against the wall wow. in this one room. And you could just see, and it was chronological, of course, so mm -hmm. you could just see the trends in yes. the colors that they used and the way that the models were positioned and everything. And it was absolutely fascinating. He was like, oh, we just put this curtain there so people would do Instagram photos next to it. But it was really just it's very a powerful. It's a it's statement a of what statement. was going on. Yeah. And we used to have, um, when I was at Ines, we had the library where you could just go up and look at all the old issues oh, and cool. see how things had changed yeah. through the years. It's, it's so fascinating. Interesting. Yeah, it really is. Well, especially since now, everyone's a photographer. Yes. Everyone is shooting. Yes. Everyone is a writer. Everyone is doing <laughs> Reading art all day long, oh, every no. place. Content, content. Content, <laughs> content. So with a content, content in mind, what's next for you? Are you you're debating? Oh. A, last time I saw you, you were debating yeah. a couple of different things. Uh, you know, still debating those? I still am, actually, which sounds ridiculous. But I, um, I gave myself a deadline of December 1st to write 100 pages of one of those ideas, okay. which, I, which I did. I, I, I accomplished oh, my goal. Oh, go you. Go me. <laughs> just so you know, we're shooting this on December 5th, so this is yeah, a recent goal. Just <laughs> <laughs> and and the outcome of this was that I actually think now what I'm going to do is write 100 pages of the other idea and then okay. see which one sticks because mm -hmm. I'm not like I just don't feel totally wedded to this this That's first idea. That's what I'm going to say. You're wedded to it. Yeah. If you're going to spend that much time on it, so much time that you have to really love it. I've yeah. heard authors that they said I just I wrote it, I handed it in, I can't spend one more minute with it. Yeah, and you realize. I think that many readers don't understand that it's not just the one year of writing it or no. the nine months of writing it. No. It's the whole editor, and then it's going on the road and talking exactly. about it for the next it's two like, years. It's like a huge part of your life, and you really, mm -hmm. it's like a relationship. You're mm -hmm. in a relationship with a book. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, you really are. Because, yeah, then you have to process it and talk about it. And, you know, it's all very these things, hard to all break up years. between the hardcover and the paperback. It's and very like, hard to really break up. Can't do and that. I don't think your publisher would be happy if you, like, published it and then said, like, I don't want to go on the road and talk about it, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I broke just not up with that book. Really, it's okay. Yeah, and the yeah. editing process. So many times, the book changes too, yeah. and like you know, like what's going on and what's happening. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so we'll see. So maybe next time I see you, I'll have made a choice. I hope <laughs> the choice of what to do. Yeah. yeah. When we saw each other in October, you were on the fence on what I, to I know, do. So now you fence. did one, which I, I think is really great. I did. So yeah, and I'm still on the fence, but I think I'm. I think I'm probably leaning towards the second one, just because the first one I'm like, eh, not yeah. totally sure about. But we had fun when you got here. Those pointing at all the books that I liked on the shelves. So yeah. we had a, like fun walk around to the oh, office. Oh, there's so this. many good books here in yeah. here. Too. I'm dying yeah, we, to we, read all we, of again. We made this like you know as our little backdrop it's, here, and I'm always sitting there thinking like, what are people thinking? Like, is behind it? It's like <laughs> these are all the books that we've been reviewing recently, and this is a look at what's happened this year. Yeah. And it's fun to sit there and look back. I haven't read any all of them. I mean, seriously, yeah. I haven't read all of yeah. them. Yeah. Well, but to just see where the trends were, like mm -hmm. what, what was happening, what was going on this year, and yep. you, you just come up with. You do come up with some a points of view as you yeah. sit there and look at what's going I bet you on. Do. Yeah, well, and I, and being a visual person, it's also fun to see the different covers and the colors yes. and you know all that sort of thing as well. So yeah, and, and we, were, we were browsing before and I have all my bets on selections, but this was one of my bets on through the mm -hmm. year, and it's so much fun because you sit there and say which ones do I remember everything about yeah. and, or where I was. Some I actually remember where I was when I was reading I them. I totally have that experience with some books, you know, yeah. and then other books it's like whoosh, just out of I, the brain. I I loved it and I can't remember why. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. have no idea, but I, I did love it. Yeah. Yeah. And you should read you it. You try to recommend it to somebody and you're like, I can't remember what it's about. I just remember thinking it was really good. <laughs> well, I do remember what this is about. Thank I you. absolutely <laughs> loved it. I thank you so much for joining oh, us today. You. I am so glad that we got to do this in a longer form besides what we did yeah. in Tucson and Morristown. Yeah, it was so much fun. Thanks. Thanks. Come back. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. Appreciate it. And we'll be back next week with another Book Reporter Talks to Interview.